Hey, aloha, and welcome to Stan the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, Stan Osterman coming to you live and direct from beautiful Kailua, Hawaii. And it uh, looks like we're starting to open up a little bit, so maybe we can get some tourism going. But hey, when you tourists come over here, if you like Stan the Energy Man and all the other shows here on Think Tech Hawaii, we're having a fundraiser this uh, fall here to try and uh, and pay the folks that uh, do all the real hard work, like Eric and the studio there and Haley. Um, to to keep these shows going and there's some really great uh, for shows uh, on every kind of topic you want to look at and especially energy I think we have probably four or five energy shows um, here on think tech but if you can uh, contribute we'd appreciate it thanks for all your support over these years this is going into year number seven for Stan the energy man which boggles my mind completely anyway today's show uh, we're going to do part two of what I call the, the bane of hydrogen, which is compression. And um, last, a couple of weeks ago, um, Dan Gowen gave us a, a uh, appetizer or a, a teaser uh, on compression and how, to, how we can make it better. Um, he's going to enlighten us a little bit more today, probably not to the point where everybody will be happy because he's got proprietary stuff he's got to keep uh, under wraps. But I'll tell you a spoiler right now is I'm gonna I'm gonna expect him to come up with a piece of hardware that I can come look at and say it really works, so <laughs> that um, so that we can go to market and solve the biggest problem in hydrogen today, which is compression. So Dan, welcome to the show again, and uh, we can get started with uh, your presentation whenever you're ready. Sure, sure. So if I can get uh, slide number one, please up there. So I'm just making another pitch for the company. Thank you, Stan, for letting me come on your show to, to talk about these issues. And no, it's great. I love having you on. I'm sure the when we do the after action, the, the audience will love what you and I are going to talk about also. It's kind of a serious issue. But in any case, so I'm just putting our pitch up there to the company. So if I get slide number two, please. So and all I'm talking there is just to just to refresh everybody's thinking about you know all the issues with with uh, the current mechanical compressors and that is you're you're building a wall of bowling balls to hold back sand and that's just to, to give you an idea how small the hydrogen molecule is that the bowling balls happen to be the iron atoms and the sand happens to be the hydrogen atoms and that the the gap between a piston and a cylinder wall is the grand canyon for for the hydrogen atom that's that's how tiny that that molecule is. so we can go to page number three please that's just another recap of uh of hydrogen embrittlement and if you look at our, our uh the previous video if you want to understand all the materials that are impervious to hydrogen and the materials that are not impervious to hydrogen as and as to what causes hydrogen embrittlement but more importantly i talk about those huge um industrial compressors which is what that top image there is and that's just the head of what one of those compressors those protrusions are valve coverings. What's inside there is a giant piston tied to a huge uh, rod, which ties back to a crankshaft. Uh, that uh, image there on the left-hand side is what hydrogen does to one of these heads after about two years. It, it destroys it, literally destroys the metal, right? So they have to rebuild these things every couple of years. And if we can go to slide number four, please. Okay, and this is just uh, from, from General Electric. General Electric builds these gigantic industrial reciprocating compressors, and these are gigantic machines. Uh, at an LNG plant, um, a small, um, they'll use, sometimes they use an electric motor, and usually the induction motor they use to drive one of these things will be about a 71, a 75 megawatt induction motor. That's 75 million watts per hour. If they have higher energy requirements, they'll usually use a gas turbine, and that can be an LM2500 to an LM9000. An LM9000 will produce the equivalent of 500 megawatts of power per hour energizing one of these huge compressors. And the reason why I'm talking about this is because you know, when, you, when I show you how little energy it really requires to compress hydrogen to, to 1,000 bar, that's about 15,000 PSI, in comparison to these machines. And the first question, a lot of these people in the oil and gas business will say, well, that can't be right or it can't be possible. And my only response to them, that's because you've been doing things the hard way, right? You're not using the physics. To you know, head. just to kind of give some folks some perspective, and I wish I had the exact numbers in my head of the different grids and the different islands, but if, I, if I'm not mistaken, 75 megawatts is probably close to the max production capability for the entire Kauai 
cooperative utility or yeah. probably more than half of the power required on the big island. I mean, we're talking a lot of energy to run that one compressor unit you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. And that's at oil refineries or LNG facilities. That's how much energy these machines are chewing up in the oil and gas business. You know, so when they look at this hydrogen problem, they truly think it's an impossible to achieve. And it has to do with because their experience is this piece of machinery that's been around for 100 years from the age of steam. And I don't know if they've, you know, if they've bothered to look inside of the National Institute of Standards Technology, their database and the data they have on hydrogen, it that data tells you right there what, what materials are impervious to hydrogen, which ones are. And if they just uh, did some more investigation on those materials to find out why they're impervious to hydrogen, they could figure out a lot of the stuff, but they just haven't. And, and it has to do with, because their experiences with this piece of machinery, not understanding that, that you're doing it the hard way, that you have to do this in a different way. But it's definitely not using this piece of machinery. We can get to slide number five, please. Okay, and there I'm just doing a recap of uh, of an effect. One is the boundary and it has to do with electrons and long surfaces. But there's another thing that's going on in that picture that most don't realize. Uh, so in that picture, I'm standing, uh, I'm, I'm sitting next to a distribution transfer. It's a, in the business, we call it a pole pig. It's attached to a telephone pole. Um, but have you ever wondered why that big container looks like a bucket? You ever wondered what's actually inside that big bucket? Stan, you ever thought about that? I've heard that it's hazmat. <laughs> no, the old transformers like 30 years ago were hazmat. Okay. All the transformers these days, what they put in there is just mineral oil. It's refined crude oil. And okay. so, so the oil, what it does, it does two things. One is oil, crude oil, hydrocarbons. It's actually an insulator. The other is it provides cooling. So the reason why there's that, that transformer that's actually inside there, that's why it's a tub, is because there's, there's mineral oil. There's, it's oil, it's highly refined crude oil that's what's in there and it's an insulator. And so what I'm describing is, is carbon can be a conductor, it can also be an insulator and the same thing with hydrocarbons. It can be a conductor, it can be an insulator. And it really all has to do with the structure of the molecule. So you'll find there's a lot of things in nature just by the shape of how things are put together gives it different physical characteristics, okay? And that's one of the ones right there attached to a telephone pole happens to be inside that distribution transform. Uh, slide number six, please. Here's where we get into the good stuff. Okay, so back in 2015, after looking through all that data that I had from this, it took me about five years to put all the pieces together. So what is that? Well, that is taken from um, an engineering blueprint that I put together and I had to take it to a machinist. And what I started out with was a piece of the Stenic stainless steel, 316 stainless steel. Uh, it, the billet was six inches in diameter, 12 inches tall. That upper chamber there is four inches in diameter. The bottom chamber is four inches in diameter. That center area where the two colors come together, that boundary area, that is two inches in diameter. Now, the largest boundary I built was 10 feet in diameter, okay? And the maximum amount of pressure that that boundary has been able to withstand so far is 57,000 PSI. So what, what is that? What it is, is whenever your hydrogen is compressed greater than 188 PSI and it turns into that supercritical fluid, it starts taking on some other characteristics, right? It starts taking on characteristics that are a lot closer to being a semiconductor. So there are different forms of hydrogen at that in the form of molecules when you're dealing with hydrogen that's been compressed to the point to where it acts like a fluid, right? That that supercritical fluid. So to give you an example, uh, if you take oxygen, if I take two atoms of oxygen, I bind them together, that forms O2. That's that life-breathing stuff we all need and love, right? But if I take three oxygen atoms and I attach them together, that forms ozone. And ozone has an effect that's a lot like chlorine. You can disinfect water with it. You can bleach your clothes white with it. Ozone, if you breathe in concentrated amounts of ozone, it will burn your lungs. It's a lot like chlorine. In fact, chemically, it reacts a lot like chlorine. And all that is, is the difference between 
two atoms of oxygen attached to each other versus three at atoms of oxygen attached to each other. Well, you have the same similar structures inside of hydrogen, and these are probably closer to metastates of hydrogen. And that those metastates exist whenever you can, when hydrogen is compressed to greater than 188 psi. Um, I first started encountering the, this, and it had to do with the fact that most of the electrolyzers that you can you can get today, there's actually like a fuel cell store where I used to be, where I used to buy my original electro, uh, electrolyzers, proton exchange membrane electrolyzers. And one of the things I noted was that most of those electrolyzers, when they output hydrogen, that hydrogen is usually come out coming out at about 20 bar of pressure. With 20 bar of pressure is about 290 psi. So the hydrogen that was coming out of the electrolyzer, the pressure was coming in at 290 psi. So it was a supercritical fluid. And that's when I started seeing these effects. So one of the, so you've got there, there's an N-type hydrogen and a P-type hydrogen. And it's a type of molecular hydrogen that only exists when hydrogen's in the supercritical state. And when those two boundaries come together, what if that boundary that forms there, the hydrogen molecule can only pass one way through the boundary. It can only pass from the N-type region to the P-type region, but it cannot go from the P to P region to the N region. It's just not possible. And if you want to know how not possible it is, 57,000 PSI is a heck of a statement to say it's not possible. The other thing is, is think about in fact, this surface is dynamic, meaning is it'll fill up the entire cavity that, th that this thing is inside of, okay? Now, how is that useful? Well, first of all, in that device right there, the boundary is stationary. It doesn't move. In 2019, um, ha I had a sort of an idea, sort of a, you know, one of those accidental sort of ideas, right? Like, I wonder if I could do that kind of thing. And it has to do with that boundary. And the question was, is it possible to move that back? That was the question. And that was March of uh, 2019 when I asked that question and I was able to answer it. So if I can get you to pay uh, slide number seven, please. So this boundary, if I can interrupt is, the boundary is a physical thing? It's a difference between N-type hydrogen and P-type hydrogen. And when those two come together, it forms this boundary. It's a lot like a diode or semiconductor. You know, a diode, electrons can only pass one way through the device, right? Well, this is a boundary where the hydrogen molecules can only pass one way through the boundary. It can't go the opposite direction. It can only pass one direction. And the reason why it occurs is because hydrogen is one of these materials that's at a boundary between the atomic world and the quantum world. Is it, what's passing through that boundary? Is it a whole atom or is, just, or is it just the protons? See what I'm getting at? It's sort of like the proton exchange membrane. What actually passes through that membrane? Is it the entire atom or is it just a proton? Well, we know in the proton exchange membrane, it's just a proton. Well, this boundary is the same way. It's just probably it's just a proton. I don't know exactly. All I know is, is that the laws of physics at that boundary don't work normally, okay? There, it's definitely a, a different place in physics, and I don't know how else to describe it. Um, I bounced laser beams through the boundary, microwaves, um, to try to figure it out, and what I can tell you is a lot of the laws of physics don't work the same at that boundary, but what I can tell you is the hydrogen molecules can only pass one way through the boundary. Uh, so if I can get you to so show slide seven up there again, please. So, so if you if you do have hydrogen migrating from the N to the P, um, and they're a different construct of hydrogen, um, are you pressurizing a proton only, or are you pressurizing a full hydrogen atom? It's compressing a full hydrogen atom. So, well, so if I use if I use uh, if I use my check valves for gas going in and gas going out, check valve for gas going in and check valve for gas going out, and I only worry about gas going into and out of the top of the tank. Now, if I move the boundary from the top of the tank to the bottom of the tank, right, it, that really doesn't do anything. Okay, mm -hmm. the only thing I'm really doing 
is I equalize the pressure with my electrolysizers. In other words, the electrolysizers will fill up the tank with hydrogen all the way up to 20 bar, right? That's all that really accomplishes. Where things get weird is when I move that boundary from the bottom of the tank to the top. Right. When I do that, because the hydrogen can't pass from the end from the p-type area to the n-type area, you can't pass the boundary. It has a tent. It, it compresses the gas. Now, normally, when you compress a gas, you get Brownian motion. The mount, the the molecules vibrate. Everything gets really hot. Well, that process of moving that boundary dampens Brownian motion. And the easiest way I can describe it, it has to do with how I move the boundary. And I'm not going to explain the details, but the easiest way I can describe it is sort of like having two waves and the waves crash against each other. When they crash against each other, they cancel their energy. Out. So by moving that boundary from the bottom of the tank to the top of the tank, it symmetrically cools and compresses the gas. Right? And it's not permeable anywhere along the, on the edges because like you say, you're not dealing with bowling balls anymore. You're dealing right. just with the, the atoms themselves. Yeah, well, think about it. I'm dealing with it. It's, it's, I'm really dealing with a fluid. It's a fluid on a fluid, right? It fills the entire cavity because you're dealing with a fluid. It's a fluid on fluid boundary is what it mm -hmm. is, right? Two different types of hydrogen having different molecular structures, but it's molecularly tied at the quantum level because it's a light fluid against a light fluid. It's just that there's a slight difference between one type of hydrogen versus the other. And it just so happens when they come together at that boundary that the hydrogen, the molecule, however that works, can only pass one way through that boundary. Could, could you make a corollary between fresh water and salt water that would kind of... That would, be a, that would be a good analogy. Or maybe <laughs> the difference between oil and water it might be another one. You know, so there's some examples of maybe different ways that could happen for different types of material. It just so happens that this is an effect that happens with hydrogen. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So the reason why I've got that analog, if I can get you to show slide seven again. The reason why that's there is because when I first did this, my only goal was to move that, uh, to move it, uh, move that boundary by 24 inches. The first time I did this, that little analog pressure meter right there went from zero to 5,000 PSI and exploded. It happened in seconds. It requires a very small amount of energy to do this. That was probably the more surprising thing about this. Um, I actually, being a dummy that I am, I actually went down and bought another one of those things, thinking maybe a defective or something. I blew up the second one. So by the time I did the second one, Stan, I decided, you know what? I can't use those analog pressure meters that max out at 5,000 PSI. Actually, I had to go out and get a pressure transducer from the digital meter. And when I measured the pressure then, it was closer to 15,000 PSI. And that was just moving it 24 inches up inside of a six inch stainless steel drill pipe. So that's how this was discovered. Not to get ahead of things, yeah, not to get ahead of things, but could could you just kind of give us a rough order of magnitude of the difference in getting your system to get to fifteen thousand psi and getting a traditional compressor to get to fifteen thousand psi? In other words, how many kilowatt hours of energy or you know well, if you're if yeah, I, you know, as far as the numbers like of Lind or Hoffer, I don't know those guys keep that under wraps. I know as far as the, the hydrogen refueling stations, it's not unusual for um, that equipment to run for almost 24 hours under 24 hours just to compress the gas up to 700 bar or 10,000 PSI. And that's 24 hours to generate the gas, but probably doesn't take any amount of time at all. But it's taking most of that 24 hours just compressing it all the way. To the, exactly. The 10,000 PSI. Exactly. So I have a way of compressing this gas that you go from zero to 5,000 PSI, you know, in 10 seconds is probably astounding, considering that those machines spend, you know, a, hours, if not days, trying to do the same thing. Exactly. You know, that's, and that, that's probably what you, you probably have more experience with that equipment. Most of my experience has to do with me going over and talking with Chris, Chris McWhitney and watching him fill up his Toyota Mariah car and 
he had to let that refilling station run for 24 hours just to generate enough gas to refill his car you know so now, chris, chris and uh and several of us talk all the time about you know how are we going to solve the compression thing and i don't know if i shared with you but back when i was working at hcat i let a contract out to an individual who claimed he could get 30,000 psi off of an electrolyzer stack and he he is a smart guy he had well over 100 um, patents in hydrogen and so i i found some money and i contracted him to build a electrolyzer that would come off the stack with 3000 psi i'm still waiting for the prototype and i saw some videos where he kind of got the pressure up there but he couldn't he couldn't show me a whole system that did it and yeah. And he had problems with, you know, getting bubbles to separate from the from the um, membranes and stuff. And it's like, I, so I, compression is a is just a it's going to be the the tough thing to get past in hydrogen. I, you know, I, I'm glad you brought that up because I know I know uh, I know Chris uh, was involved around a lot of that stuff too, and I know um, some of the people over at the Department of Energy were part of it. And I, I was watching a lot of the reports that were going because there's a lot of good indications that you should be able to do this with electrolysis, right? The problem is, is when you start getting those pressures up in the materials that you have to use to build the electrolyzer, and then what happens is that the, the combination of the, the temperature of the hydrogen, the materials, hydrogen brittlement, and what happens is the amount of current and amperage just goes skyrockets right through the roof, right? Exactly. So you quickly figure out that a combination of all these things that do electrolysis combined with compressing hydrogen that it, it should work in theory but when you put all the parts together it, it just doesn't and, and even if you built your electrol i mean you couldn't build your electrolyzer out of the materials that are purpose to hydrogen because those materialists are here's the list for making the electrolyzer here's a list for making the you know materials that are purpose to hydrogen they're on the not on the same yeah. list it, yeah. that's what gave me the clue how to do this was basically I had to sort of separate. I mean, there were a lot of things in electrolyzer that sort of led you down this path, but you couldn't do it with the electrolysis, that it had to be a completely separate thing. And what I had to do was focus on, like I said, that boundary. That boundary exists in a lot of different things. Like you said, fresh water versus salt water, oil and water. It exists in it, but it exists in that fluid state and it only exists under high pressure conditions. And so, for example, what one of the things I know that plagues like the hydrogen refueling business, because I know Chris and I have talked about it, is that whenever your pressure is real high, it's hard for you to push the hydrogen for, through those tubes. And the reason why is the tubes are too small. Why? Because what's actually inside that tube is a fluid, not a gas. I mean, you're used to thinking of the hydrogen at 700 bar going in your car, that that's a gas. It's not. What's going in your car is a fluid, a super critical fluid. So you need larger diameter tubes to get over that resistance area because you're dealing with the resistance of a fluid being passed through the tube. And it goes back to just understanding you're not dealing with the gas, you're dealing with the fluid. And that's sort of where it led me to figuring out I had to use this fluid boundary thing to make this work. Okay. So if I can get you to go to page eight. Okay. So on that page right there, That'll tell you how much energy it actually takes to do it. So prototype equipment. So that power supply right there, it's a prototype. It weighs 5,200 pounds. I have to move it around with a pallet jack, okay? I wish I could put that in the back of my pickup truck, but I can't. Um, that uh, uh, ASME certified pressure vessel right there, it's a 3,000 liter tank, and I don't know how many tons it weighs, right? But so the it's power hard. supply is on the right and the and the pressure vessels on the trailer on the left. Right. And so the scale that that that's a, a huge trailer and and probably not a very big uh, power supply size wise. Yeah. 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 You know, that power supply there. I mean, the, so the equation is and understand that that is not the max amount of pressure that that power supply actually is capable of pushing. So. Uh, there's an equation, and I'm not going to talk about the equation, but the, the easiest way to understand this is it's 0 0.038 watts, 384 watts times 1,000 bar, that's the pressure, times liters per minute, times 60 minute will tell you how many watts per hour that device will consume. Now, that 3,000 liter tank 
Uh, at 20 bar pressure, we'll hold five kilograms of hydrogen gas. And if I compress it to a thousand bar, that'll, that'll basically compress the hydrogen, which is occupying 3000 liters. It'll actually compress the hydrogen down into three liters. So five kilograms of hydrogen being compressed into three liters of volume, the equivalent of three one liter you know, bottles is what it's equivalent to. Yeah. So, uh, but, uh, but that actual device, the top end of the device, well, it should be 60,000 PSI. I was only able to drive it up to 57,000 PSI before I blew out a couple. Oh, so, total failure. Oh, yeah. It's just <laughs> broken. 50,000 PSI. Holy mackerel. Well, 57,000. I, yeah. I was gone for six day and, you know, but yeah. anyway, my, my CO got mad at me. He said, damn, stop risking your life until we, we get you the proper lab that you need to go to. Okay. Well, I tell you what, but, we're getting really close to the end. Do you, do you want to just keep going on? Yeah, this let's go keep going. Can I go to page number eight, and then we All can right. we can sort of try to finish this thing up. So that there, uh, uh, if you were going to match a megawatt grid seal electrolyzer, um, that that'd be the tank you would match that electrolyzer up. That that tank would hold thirteen thousand two hundred liters of of gas. So that's that's a fracking tank, right? Right, that's that fracking tank we're talking, the 15,000 liters. And what the idea being is you would probably spend your first hour filling the tank up with 13,200 liters of hydrogen, that's 22 kilograms. You would probably spend the second hour actually compressing it to a thousand bar. So the power supply for that tank doesn't exist yet. That's something I haven't built yet. So, so everybody understands I'm at the lab stage. So let's go to page number 10. So I, I built a model just to give everybody an idea. And that's a two, two tanks of redundant, redundant power supplies. But the idea there is basically you're filling one tank up with hydrogen gas, allowing the electrolyzer to fill up one tank. The second tank, you'd be compressing the gas. And when the second tank, the gas is what's compressed and the first tank you know, was filled up with gas then those two tanks would swap states and you'd be compressing the gas in tank A, and you would be filling tank B up with gas. So there would be a system that would be generating 22 kilograms of hydrogen per hour and compressing it and, and pushing it along to like a, a gas well to, to pressurize that gas at a thousand bar. So um, that's that's where, where we are right now. So well, are you actually in the process of building um, a model with a larger power supply and, and a little bit, um, you know, a little bit more of a prototype you can actually demonstrate with hydrogen gas? Uh, well, the issue is, is I really don't, I actually don't have a reason to build it. I mean, my prototype power supply is more than enough to perform the experiments I'm doing right now, mm -hmm. right? But uh, as far as a 15,000 liter, I just, I don't yeah. have the reason to build it, so. Right, I mean, right. Part of this is a capital issue, and you know, in in the environment we're we're in right now, venture capital. Hopefully, some of the venture capital is starting to clear up, and and we can uh, we can finish taking this out of the lab and then industrializing it. Hopefully, we can get there. But but right now, I I just don't have a reason to build that. You know, the next one. I mean, what I'm doing right now propels all I need with the experiments I'm doing right now. So, well, hopefully, somebody with an industrial need for megawatt plus scale uh, green hydrogen uh, will be interested in, in building something a larger scale to, to take care of this and, and work with you on it. So if we succeed in nothing in this discussion, except furthering the discussion and getting it to the next level, I'm, I'm happy with the discussion. Well, just so everybody understands this video, the, the, the target market for this really isn't the transportation sector. Uh, what I'm per actually proposing is actually a really large change to the power grid. That means that the people I'm targeting is the mayor of your town. It's your sheriff. It's your state congressman and senators is the governor of your state, right? Understand that even if you're an Elon Musk, you probably couldn't get this accomplished. It would, this has to come from, like I said, a governor of a state because your public utility is a uh, is a regulated monopoly controlled by your state government. And what I'm proposing is a huge change to the infrastructure, the energy structure of your state, of any state, yeah. right? So this is really something that can only be handled at the political level. All right. 
Well, we wanted to get into a little bit more general discussion of uh, worldwide energy situation. And shoot, if we wait till next week, it it may already come to fruition. But um, let's plan on having you back next week. And, well, we uh, do it again next week, and we can talk about these bigger energy pictures. And I'm pretty sure that it won't play out by next week, Stan. No, but it'll it'll certainly show some trends, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, we'll have that much more trend data that we know yeah. what path we're working on. But uh, okay. I'm pretty sure it won't be resolved by then. So. All right, Dan. Well, thanks for the discussion and enlightenment today. Um, I think you've given a bunch of really smart people some things to think about and some ways to solve a really serious issue with hydrogen. But it's going to have to be solved at that grid scale. I yeah. mean, that's it really will be. You were talking salt domes and stuff before for storage. That's the scale we're talking about. And we don't even think about producing that much hydrogen right now, but that's to replace the fossil fuel industry that's in place right now. That's the scale we got to work at. Well, not so, only that, not only that, Stan, but if you look at the machine that I'm proposing, that's this is the machine that will solve this issue. I, I'd be different if we could solve it a different way, but you know, from the physics I'm seeing, I don't, it's not solvable. Yeah. This is the only way to really do it. No, you can't, what's the old, old saying? You can't solve a problem by doing the same thing you've been doing. You know, we got to do it different. Yep. Well, Dan, we've gone a little bit over time, but I'd like to thank you. And uh, we'll have you back next week. And we'll talk a little bit more about the macro uh, energy uh, um, economics and what's going on in the world. Thank you, Stan. So until next week, Stan Energy Man signing off. And we'll get some exciting discussion next week. Aloha.